Hi, everyone. In this video, we are going to go over chapter seven, which is about network. So, or computer network, which includes telecommunications, the internet, and wireless technology. So what do we really mean by computer network? So computer network refers to two or more connected computers in order to share information or to exchange messages whether it is text, files, videos, and, and, and so on. So the major components of a simple network includes the client-server computers that we have discussed actually, and we talked about in previous lectures. So client here refers to a computer, it can be a desktop, laptop, that is connected to a server. It can be one client, it can be multiple clients. An example of a client computer can be a POS or a point of sales, you know, a desktop computer that is connected to a server that is stored in the back back room of an office, small office or in a building uh, and, and, and so on. So uh, another component of a network is network interface, which you call it NICS. So this can be the slot where the ethernet cable can, can be inserted into in a, in a desktop or a laptop or any device. And, or in, in the past, there it used to come in the form of an antenna. And um, in other places, it can come as a slot where uh, a USB uh, can be inserted to get internet through that USB. And then we have connection medium, which you know, basically refers to the wiring and cables that connect the network components. And then we have the network operating system. So this is um, an operating system that is installed in the in a server or in a, in, a, in that machine. And then uh, we have hubs, we have switches and routers. So what do we mean here by hubs? Those can be good questions for for an exam or a quiz. So for example, the hub uh, is a device. So uh, uh, similar to switch, so the hub is not as smart as the switch. But they, what they, uh, the hub does is it connects the different clients or different computers. Um, for example, um, or a computer to a server or a computer to a router. Um, and the hub, one problem with the hub, the hub is it's not as smart as as switches because if one of the nodes or let's say a client computer needs to send a message to another computer in a in a, a network that has multiple computers so the hub unfortunately will send that same message to all connected computers in that network so it doesn't differentiate uh, to which uh, computer that message should go it makes it it sends it to all uh, nodes or to all computers so on the other hand switch device sends that message to the specific computer that you define as uh, from your computer from your client computer so that's the difference between the hubs and the switches and uh, the routers they are the devices that connect the local area network to the inter uh, to the intranet or to other networks um, and then we have software defined uh, networking, so those functions and switches and routers managed by central management uh, program, those are great for uh, cloud computing. So let's look at the, how the, the local area network look, looks like. So we have a server and we have multiple clients. So there are PCs it can, and then they are connected through a switch. Here we can see the switch. Uh, we say the switch and the hub, they do the same work. They connect different uh, clients or different computers with <clears throat> With the server and the router but the switches they are smarter and then the router connects our local area network with the network with the internet or with other uh, other local area networks so how about networks in large companies so in large companies we have multiple local area networks and they are linked using firmware-wide uh, corporate networks so then uh, we have also a couple several servers that are used for the local for large companies like web web server corporate intranet server 
uh, backend systems uh, servers like SQL, um, Microsoft SQL Server or B DB2 from IBM, and, and just kind of to name a few of the backend systems, uh, basically our servers. And then we have mobile wireless or uh, LANs, so Wi Fi networks. Uh, video conferencing systems. This is an example of that was Cisco Telepresence. That was a, a hardware that is in a conference room um, in the past for, for video conferencing. So right now, nowadays, we we have Zoom, we have Teams, we have uh, uh, other uh, cloud-based systems that you don't have to have your hardware installed in uh, in, in, a, in a certain room in order to be using, to be able to use video conferencing. So, um, and then we have uh, telephone network, wireless cell phone. This is just an example. So we have here the wired LAN. So computers connected to a server. And then we have the wireless LAN or local area network. And then you have the other examples and multiple servers here. So client server uh, computing, we have distributed computing model. And one thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that the, the clients, they are connected through a network server computer, right? And, uh, and the server sets rules and also assigns addresses to those clients, right? Uh, so that way um, uh, it provides every client with an address, right? That way, when uh, one computer wants to communicate, communicate with the other computer, they know or they can do that through the address. So then uh, packet switching technology, this is a method for sending messages. So those messages can be voice messages, can be video messages, it can be text messages, email messages, whatever. But that message, so the, the, the packet switching, you can think about it as a house uh, made of Legos, right? You have a small house, let's say this size, and then you wanna send it to another uh, computer or another location. And in order to facilitate the, 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 the sending uh, transmission of this house to another location through a pipe, for example, you will need to just assemble it. So break it down into pieces, send it, and then they, they can reassemble it when you send it, when you send it to the other destination. So this is kind of the same thing that is done through packet switching. So it divides that message into different pieces. We call them packets. And those packets, they get sent to the other destination through different pathways, different lines uh, that will connect them to the uh, the fastest to the, its destination. When it uh, arrives to the, its uh, uh, destination, it gets reassembled. And this is a great illustration of packet switching uh, method. So you have data that connect that has multiple packets and divides it into multiple packets. And every packet is sent through different pathways. And when it reaches its destination, before it reaches its destination, then it gets reassembled into the original message. So we have also the TCP IP. Those are protocols. What do we mean by protocols? They refer to rules that manage or control the transmission of information between two points, right? So those protocols, you know, which includes the, the transmission or some they call it transfer control protocol, and um, which is TCP, and then internet protocol, which is also called internetwork protocol, IP. So those were introduced in 1983 by the Department of Defense as a standard for, for, for the internet. And, I, and uh, because in, before that, they used to have different standards and, and it was confusing for, for message sending and receiving messages through the internet. So then uh, as we, we know that the internet was born in the 60s through a project by the Department of Defense in order to transfer uh, scientific um, data or information between scientists from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, and then it, it is the internet that we know it today, right? 
So then also the Department of Defense uh, introduced this TCP IP reference model, which consists of four layers. We have the application layer, that's where the HTTP uh, is a component of. And then we have trans transport layer, we have the internet layer, that's where the IP is part of that layer. And then the network interface layer, that's where the network uh, components are, are, are in place, including the switches and modem and, and uh, the switches, the, the, um, and, and the cables, uh, wiring, and so on. So this is an example here of transmission or how would we use the TCP the reference model. So uh, computer A would send a message to a computer B. So it goes through application uh, layer, transport layer, internet layer, and the network interface. That's when uh, the packet switching switching gets it takes a place where it divides the the message into packets, and then it gets sent uh, as it arrives to the network um, interface layer of computer B. Then it starts reassembling that message. So then we talk about the different signals. There are two types of signals. We have the digital signal, which refers to on or off, zeros and ones. <laughs> uh, so that's the digital signal. And then we have the analog signals, which are the waves, uh, the wavy kind of looking uh, signals, right? So you can think about the digital uh, signals. They are the signals that are sent from the computer until it reaches the modem. And then from the modem until it reaches the modem of the other computer. So in other words, the analog signals, they are <coughs> they are used in, in the phone lines as well as the cable, uh, the, the cable lines, right? So that's uh, analog signals. But when you, you you send your message to the from your computer to the to the modem, then that's a digital um, signal, right? Which is zeros and ones, and this is how it looks like. So the digital signal from your computer to the modem it is zeros and ones or digital, uh, on or off. And then we have from the modem until it reaches through the internet, through the um, through the cable lines or the phone line, until it reaches its um, or wireless media uh, until it reaches its destination, it is through analog. And then, uh, so then the modem, what does the modem stand for? So that would be a good question for an exam or a quiz. So a modem stands for modulator. So the MO stands for modulator and the DM stands for demodulator. So modulator, demodulator, in, uh, the modem actually translates or transforms um, the digital signals into analog, right, from your computer. And then when you treat uh, the modem on that second computer, it transforms the analog signal into digital signals. So it, that's basically what we mean here by that modem and what it does. And then we have different types of networks. We have local area network. That's we have multiple computers that are connected through a server or peer-to-peer, -peer, computer to computer. So we use Ethernet technology, which is the wires that connect to computers. Um, and then we have the client server. Um, that's when we have multiple computers connected through a server or peer-to-peer -peer when we have, let's say, two computers, we can connect a computer with the other computer through that um, uh, without having to have a server. And then we have wide area network. So this is when we have uh, country or region or country or transcontinental network, we call it one or wide area networks. And then we have metropolitan area from its name, it is for a city or a metro area uh, network. And then we have campus area network, which is campus like a university campus or uh, Apple company campus, just, you know, just as an example. Uh, and then the, for the physical transmission media, we have twisted pair wire. I provided you with examples here that twisted from its name. They are uh, copper uh, wires that they are twisted and it can serve up to uh, uh, 10 gigabyte per, per second, I believe, uh, especially the CAT6, right? And uh, one one issue with the, with the twisted pair 
wire is it, it suffers from interference sometimes. Now, on the other hand, uh, the coaxial cable is used by cable companies, and this is how it looks like. Uh, so it doesn't have that interference issue that uh, the twisted pair wires have. And it can also transmit up to one uh, gigabyte uh, of uh, internet speed. And then we have uh, uh, fiber optic cable. So the fiber optic cable, as you can see here in this image, it is. It consists of fiberglass that transfers pulse electric pulses through that are generated through laser, right? So it is super fast, and its capacity is is super large. So it can handle up to five plus petabyte per second, right? So uh, it is the fiber optic cable is used for as a backbone. Uh, so what we mean here by the backbone, it is the, the cables that are connected between continents through the oceans, <clears throat> right? And the last mile as well. And then we have wireless transmissions, media and devices, so such as satellites and cellular systems. Those are through the cellular towers. And then we talk about bandwidth, which refers to the transmission speed. Uh, we use bits per second. And then uh, we use Hertz, which is the number of cycles per second. And then we use the bandwidth, which is the difference between the highest frequency and the lowest frequency. And so the internet, the world's most extensive network. So uh, we have access uh, to the internet through uh, internet service providers. So those are the companies that have uh, permanent access to the internet, and then they retail it and uh, and provide temporary access to consumers with fees. So they, and then there are different types of internet connections. So they include dial-up. I don't think anyone uses dial-up uh, internet connection anymore. This was, I remember in the early 2000s when I used to have internet, it used to be dial-up through my landline. And then we have digital subscriber line, DSL and Fios, Fiber. So those are, are, are fast. They can go up to one gigabyte per second. And then we have cable internet connections. Also, they can, those are through cable, <clears throat> cable companies, cable TV company. So they, it can be up to one gigabyte as well. And then satellite. Uh, so satellite uh, internet connection, this is where if a house doesn't have access to cable, uh, is not connected through a cable or through uh, a DSL, then they can have access to the internet through satellite, which is not as fast and it's not as reliable as the wired ones. And then we have T1 and T3. Those are dedicated lines of internet to certain businesses, universities, and governments. And then we have... Uh, <clears throat> So every device that is connected to the internet must have an IP address. And, and the old system is the 32-bit system for IP addresses. And we are running out of this those numbers. So again, this is an IP address. And, uh, and then um, we have this domain name system, which transforms or uh, it converts the IP addresses to domain names. So, for example, for us, University of Texas uh, or utrgv.edu, that's uh, the domain name in, in text, right? But that domain name is an actual IP number. It looks, it has numbers like this in this, in this format. But for us, we see it as text. But in actuality, it's an IP number of the server that hosts the web pages of UTRGV, right? Uh, and <clears throat> the domain names uh, is has hierarchical structure starting from the top domain. So this is an example. So the top domain is the .org, the um, .com, .edu, .net, and so on. So we call that top level domain. And then whatever comes before that, we call it the second level domain. So UTRGV can be second level domain. And whatever comes before that, we call that third 
So my course is .etrgv.edu. That would be third level um, domain. So, um, so we talked about internet service provider earlier, right? Those are the retailer. But now we have the network service provider. Those are the ones who own the the trunk lines or the the backbone. So those are the who own those cables, right? The the actual cables that travel through countries or through con uh, through continents and countries, right? So uh, who owns the network service? Who are those ser network service providers? It is the long distance phone companies and governments that own that. And uh, so, um, and then we have regional telephone and cable TV companies. Those are the internet service providers that we know like Spectrum, AT&T, just to name a, a few as examples. And then we have professional organizations uh, and government bodies that help to establish standards for the internet. Uh, that way, those standards are uh, are used worldwide. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. So we have uh, uh, those standards used all over the world. It makes it easier to have devices that use the same standard uh, for interoperability. Right. So this is an example, or this is an um, an a description, or of how the backbone. That's those are the the main lines uh, of the internet, like that. What we saw here, and then uh, we have the metropolitan area exchanges, and then getting to regional hosts. Right or regional, we have T1 here line. That's the dedicated line of internet. <clears throat> we talked about earlier in the regional host. Those are the ISP providers. And then we have the, we talked earlier about IP and we said we are running out of the 32 bit system. But now uh, we have the IPv6. So this is a system that is based on 128 bit system so that means to raise to the power of 128 so it will provide more than quadrillion new addresses so this will solve that ip problem because now any any we said any device device that is connected to the internet must have an ip address so now with the internet of things we uh, we definitely need to to have ipv6 Something that has uh, can can encompass and uh, handle the, the, this large need for IP addresses, and then we have Internet too. So this advanced network and consortium, including universities, businesses, and it is going to be up to a hundred gigabit per second. Hundred. So now the fastest that we can get is let me let me see. The fastest in our, our university can maybe reach one gigabyte, uh, gigabit per second. That's the fastest. All right. That's Google Fiber that we mentioned. They they started. I remember when I was in Kansas City in 2015, they started uh, Google Fiber in Kansas City and Austin as, uh, as a test, and they had up to one gigabyte, uh, gig gigabit per second. So let's see uh, if we can test the. Uh, the speed of a computer here. So let's see here, speed test, and see if we can test the speed here at the university. So you can do the same thing at your uh, home computer and see to test the speed of you. So this one, maybe the theoretical should be up to one gig, uh, one gig, gigabit per second. But right now, maybe because there is a, a lot of usage for, for the internet, a lot of people are using it. So that's what I'm getting right now in this moment. Uh, but you get the idea. You can test also on your phone, uh, do the same thing. Just go to Google and uh, speed test and see your phone might be, uh, it doesn't have as much uh, speed as your desktop. 
especially my computer is wired through the internet, uh, ethernet, right? So it is wired internet rather than Wi-Fi. So now my, my phone is connected through um, Wi-Fi. So let me test my Wi-Fi through the phone. So it is barely giving me maybe 20 megabits per second. Uh, but you got the idea now. Let's see. <sighs> so internet services. So internet provides us with all those services. You skip them, and then we have uh, another technology, or or uh, we have voice over IP. So in the past, uh, if you wanted to call someone. Uh, outside your city, then they call it long distance, or even outside your state or outside the country, they they will the phone companies will charge you long distance fees, right? Calls. So now uh, with voice over IP, that means you can make phone calls, uh, you know, FaceTiming uh, through the internet for for free. Right, so Zoom is is one example of VoIP or voice over IP. WhatsApp also is an example of voice over IP. <clears throat> so it is digital voice communication using IP packet switching. And then the unified communication, what we mean by that is in the past, the voice or the phone companies used to provide voice services, which is phone calls, separately from the data uh, companies that provide internet and service, uh, internet service uh, companies, right? And conferencing with, was uh, separate and email was separate. So now there, there is a unified communication. So all of those services are provided, can be provided by one. So then we have virtual private network, VPN. This is, uh, it uses uh, a tunneling, tunnel, T-U-N-N-E-L, Tunnel link uh, method for to secure and uh, an encrypt private uh, network run over the internet. So <laughs> this is what uh, we mean by void. So the void uh, uses the the uh, uh, what we called it earlier the packet uh, pack, packeting the switch uh, packet switching. Right, so you have a message, it divides it into packets, ABC sends it <clears throat> through the internet when it, it reaches the gateway of the end user or the, the, the destination, it reassembles and then it appears as it was intended to, to appear, right? And then this is what we mean here by the tunneling. This is the tunnel that, uh, provides VPN or virtual private network. So communication is protected <clears throat> through those tunnels. And then uh, hypertext, so we have hyper markup or HTML. Mm -hmm. So this is the language that the browser would, will, will, be, will read, right? So for example, here, uh, if I wanna read, you pay source, so this is HTML, right? So browser actually language is HTML. And so, and then we have the HTTP. HTTP is the protocol that the browser uses to request access to a website. So for example, when you start typing google.com uh, on your browser. So the browser uses HTTP to request access from the server that, that hosts google.com. So it can display the web pages of, of that particular URL you sent, you, you, you clicked on or you, you sent. And then we use a URL or your uniform resource locator, which consists of the HTTP, it, consists of the domain name. So this is the domain name, www.megacorp.com. And then here, this one is the directory. So URL consists of a combination of HTTP, domain name, 
which is this guy, and then the directory where the file is located. So this is the name of a folder, the name folder, and this is the name of the file or the page, uh, which is .html. So what, what is the purpose or the, <clears throat> the role of web servers? So it's a software for locating and managing web pages. And then when it comes to search engines, so the most common ones, we have Google and Bing. And today there are more than, uh, actually in 2019, Google reported that there are more than 5 billion web pages indexed through Google. And uh, there were more than 2 billion web pages just by Facebook at that time. And, uh, and then we have the deep web also uh, has more than trillion web pages. What do we mean here by the deep web? That means it, those web pages cannot be accessed um, to the public. So they need subscription or they are private companies and, and so on. And then we have mobile search. So the majority of people do search through mobile. So um, they are uh, enabled or optimized. A lot of uh, websites optimize their, their mobile search. And then we have the semantic search, uh, which is a smart way, <clears throat> more intelligent, more smart way of um, uh, optimizing the searches to return the most re relevant uh, pages to, to the search that keywords that you are searching for. And then the predictive search is this, this is when you start typing, uh, you know, you start typing while you are searching. So for example, this is Google, right? It says, I start typing here, master. See, as soon as I start typing, it suggests for me here what to, what to type, right? Um, and this is exactly what I want. And I'm interested in, here it is, it says sponsor. So we have sponsored, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Uh, we have sponsored searches, or and then we have unsponsored, right? But you got the idea of uh, the uh, predictive search, and then we have visual search. Um, we have visual search. So in other words, you can search for by images. You can search by videos. You can search by uh, sound and so on. And then we have intelligent agent shopping bots. So those are robots that are used by uh, companies like Tra Travego or Kayak. So they search uh, for travel, for example, they search the, the internet for the information that you are interested in and organize it in a nice way based on price. And they, they get their own um, uh, commission from from this and then we have the search engine marketing so 44 percent of expenses spent on ads are actually allocated um, to search engine marketing so you can imagine that uh, how much money is spent on search engine marketing so and then we have search engine optimization so this is <clears throat> a way where where websites, they need to use certain phrases and certain uh, keywords. They need to include certain phrases and certain keywords in their websites in order to be identified and optimized. In other words, when people search for certain thing, they can uh, pop up at, at the top of the, of the list. So this is uh, another, another thing that I wanted to emphasize is for you, when you are preparing your resume, the majority of resumes uh, or the majority of, of companies or corporations, they use robots actually to, to search your resume if it is relevant to what they are looking for. So that's why you need to include all the keywords that you have uh, that are relevant that you are learning in this class. So for example, you definitely need to include SQL in your, in your uh, technical skills, Microsoft Access, uh, Pivot Tables, Power Pivot, and Tableau data visualization, data mining, machine learning, just kind of to name a few, and text mining. So you need to put those text words um, or, or keywords in your resume to optimize. So again, 
I want you to focus on this keyword here, SEO or abbreviation, because I might ask you a question about it in the exam or the quiz. So the search engine optimization, what it does, it basically, uh, you need to use certain keywords and certain phrases to optimize the, 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 the search. So again, here, this shows that Google is compromising almost two thirds of, of the uh, engine uh, search engines in, in the world. Uh, we already talked about how Google works and we talked about Hadoop uh, and how Google uses multiple servers, multiple uh, computers, uh, divides the tasks into those and then uses indexing and ranking uh, the relevance of the searches and then displays those uh, those relevant ones. Uh, so <clears throat> we have, we have web one one versus web two So what we mean here by web one is that the internet or the websites used to be very static, meaning that they would just display information for people. Uh, and as an end user, you can't contribute to that website. You can't actually add content or uh, or generate content into that website. So that's what we called it web 1.0. So now web 2.0, where you, you are able to, as a user to generate content to be uh, the website, uh, websites are more interactive. So examples of social media, you can post, Create you, you generate your own content, you can like, you can dislike, you can do a lot of things, right? So that, that's what we mean by 2.0. So the future of, of the web, uh, more tools to make sense of trillions of pages on the internet. So one tool that was recently uh, discussed and up until today is the chat GPT. So that actually makes sense of trillions of web pages using AI or artificial intelligence. And then we have pervasive, uh, pervasive uh, web. So an example of that is uh, the city traffic lights, for example, can be, uh, and, and so on. And then we have the internet of things. So what we mean here by internet of things, they are they refer to sensors uh, or they are, Sensors that are connected to the internet to uh, without human computer interaction, without interaction between humans and computers, right? And they transmit information through the through the internet. And then we have the app internet. Uh, so again, the the web browsers are much slower than using the app. So for example, if I'm using Facebook through a browser, it might not. Uh, be as an intuitive and as optimized as, as I am using the app itself, right? And then we have increased, <clears throat> and so I will skip those, move on. So uh, there are two competing, competing standards in terms of cellular systems. There are two systems, uh, cellular systems in the world. The GSM, which is the system used in the rest of the world, and uh, some of the companies in the United States use it, AT&T uh, AT and T-Mobile. And then the rest of the world, you, uh, and the United States uses CDMA, right? Which is rise and spread. So the internet, <clears throat> third generation, or again, uh, for a cell, cellular system, uh, 3G or 3G, third generation, 3G, that was, you know, below that is the edge that you might notice it if you're in a rural area. And then, uh, which was suitable for email access web browsing, but not for a video. Um, and then the fourth generation, which was up to 100 megabyte a bit per second. So that would, so would be suitable for videos, right? And it uses the LTE and WiMAX technology, long-term evolution that stands for LTE. Right? And then we have the 5G networks. So uh, several countries started implementing the 5G networks, uh, starting in the United States and uh, and China. They are the first to implement 5G networks. And this is gigabyte, gigabit uh, capacity. So it can have 
multiple gigabits, maybe five gigabit, uh, maybe more actually, and starting to be uh, launched by AT and T, Verizon here, and other carriers carriers here in, in the United States. And then we have the Bluetooth technology, which can link up to eight devices in a ten meter area. So um, some of the examples of the uses um, of, of Bluetooth can be the wireless mouse, wireless keyboard, the, the headsets, and your phone, clickers, just kind of to name a few. And then they are, uh, <clears throat> and then we have the Wi-Fi. So I want you to remember this number here for Wi-Fi because I might ask you a question about it. So we have 802.11, that's, that's when, when I use this number, I basically refer to Wi-Fi, 802.11. So it has several uh, sets of standards and the latest one is the 802.11 AC, which can have up to one gigabit per second, right? And then we have, uh, Wi-Fi access range up to 30, 300 feet and used for wireless NAN and uh, wireless internet access. So access points, those are the ones that you might see uh, if you run into in, in the library or you uh, if you are in the library or if you are in, in the airport or, um, uh, or in a classroom, you might see that the Wi-Fi the little box uh, or device the you know, hanging on the roof somewhere, uh, not on the roof, but on the ceiling. Uh, so it, this device has radio receiver transmitter for connecting wireless devices to a wired LAN. So we call them access points. So if we have multiple, one or multiple in public places, we call them hotspots, right? So the access points in airports, in a cafe, we call them hotspots. They are less uh, secure. They have very weak security features. And then we have WiMAX, which is uh, technology, can provide wireless technology uh, access for a range of 31 miles. So, so let's see now, uh, radio frequency identification, RFID. This is a very interesting technology. It doesn't require line of sight. Uh, Per se, so it doesn't really require require line of sight. So what do I mean by line of sight? So for example, if I I want to uh, uh, re, you know uh, use my clicker, I need to point it to that to the sort to to the USB in order to move it. So uh, but RFID doesn't need that line of sight. I you know it doesn't have to see it. It can go through walls. It can go through uh, so it will still work. Uh, so uh, radio or RFID, basically they are tiny tags with microchips. Uh, so again, microchips that we talked about in the previous weeks uh, are, are a key in those RFID. And those tags, tiny tags of microchips can be read by RFID readers. And those readers are connected to wireless network or wired networks and uh, and can be sent to a database management system. So it, it can be connected to to uh, to through the internet, right? So they they are very useful for automated toll collection. So for example, if you're driving through a toll uh, highway, there are readers on the top. You will see them, and you have the the toll tag. In your in your car windshield, so it can read it automatically. You don't have to stop and pay for the toll. It automatically reads it and charges you through your uh, account with that with that uh, toll company. Now Walmart uses it also a lot to to track their the, their their stocks. Um, you know, on the shelves and also their shipment in their warehouses. So it can recognize if a product uh, stock is depleting, then it automatically or it can 
replenish those uh, depleting stocks on. And that's what makes uh, Walmart also uh, having this competitive advantage, right? Uh, again, the reduction of cost of those tax, those RFID uh, can cost up to maybe seven to 10 cents per tag. So it's very cheap. And uh, you have UPS, for example, are planning to use RFID uh, for their shipment. So that way it can be automatically connected to, to the internet. They don't, it doesn't require the human intervention or a person to, to send that uh, updates to, uh, to the customers. So it can be, everything is automated. Now you can range uh, one inch to, uh, to 100 feet. And this is an example here of, uh, I added this as an example for you to see how they are used and where they can be located. Very tiny tags of microchips. Again, near field communication. Again, this is RFID related technology that we use when we go we use our credit card instead of uh, inserting it into the credit card machine, we just wave it and then it reads it automatically, right? Apple Pay, Google Pay, those are examples as well of this technology. Wireless sensors networks. So again, uh, those sensors are used for detect uh, hazardous substances um, the, in the air, monitor environmental changes, the traffic, uh, just to name a few. Um, and then also they require very low power. Um, they can be lasting for long. And the major sources of big data and fueling the Internet of Things. So we talked about the Internet of Things. And I wanted to uh, uh, want you to, to have a look at this, those two videos. And this video in particular shows how the Internet of thing, Things has been implemented in the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, in 2022 and how they use sensors in the balls uh, and and also within the stadium to detect the offsides so you i will let you watch that and uh, that's all that i wanted to cover for today and um, i wish you all the best